Good. So, where did we get to last lecture? Last lecture, I introduced you to the formalisms of quantum theory, which still, in terms of calculation, is, is, is largely the state of the art still. It's correct, it predicts things, it's very useful. Um, and it seems to predict that all fundamental particles, all of the smallest things, atoms and photons and nuclei and you know, all these tiny things, um, and if you try really hard, even molecules and such like, um, seem to have some you know, grainy nature. They come in packets of energy somehow. Um, particularly photons, but also, but there's something of the wave about them. Um, in particular, uh, we can make predictions on, on what objects are going to do using an equation that seems to describe a wave, but it's not a real wave, it's a wave of probability. No one's really sure what it is, a wave of. It seems to be some abstract mathematical construct, which is very useful it doesn't really tell us much about what is happening, just what will happen. Do you remember the very first image I think I showed in the whole thing? I had you know, some picture of an atom, and quantum physics is great at describing that, and then some data, and quantum physics is great at just guessing what data you're going to have, and then a big question mark in the middle, because what happens between those two things, quantum theory struggles to say. And so it does lead to predictions, which are very useful. Um, and so one might say you just leave it there. You go, oh, maybe you know one day we'll understand what all this means, but it makes predictions, so what? But it doesn't just make predictions that we're all very comfortable with. It predicts some very strange things. So I, I finished the last lecture with an image of the double slit experiment, um, where you send a single particle through, and a single particle seems to somehow know that there are two slits, and not only that, it seems to know if you're watching one of the gaps to see where the particle goes. And so what we need to try and get our head around is some of the interpretations of quantum theory, so what people are thinking about this and what it all means. And so we'll start with... Um, something you may well have heard of, and a uh, um, famous interpretation called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Um, so, as I said, we make all these predictions, we don't have an interpretation, and no one's particularly happy with this. Um, so, Heisenberg and Bohr, who are both working in Copenhagen, in particular, advocated um, a theory um, which really um, only dealt with prediction. They actually said, we're going to get away, we're going to just throw away the objective reality of particles flying around. Why should that be? We don't feel that should be. All we think is true is that when you measure something, it has a property. Why should it have that property before you measure it? This is the Copenhagen interpretation. This is a, this is a picture of, of how... Bohr and Heisenberg uh, will have thought of the universe. Here's my universe, the whole universe. And inside this universe, I have my quantum system, whatever that is, some atom doing something, some photons whizzing around, my quantum system, which I describe by the rules of quantum mechanics. And I have one mathematical thing which describes all of this in its entirety, which I call the wave function or the state vector, depending who you are, it's this psi in this uh, funny shaped bracket here. And that tells me that somehow contains all the information about this quantum system. So all the information about it is contained within this thing, which mathematically is a vector, you know? And then the interaction between our world, the classical world, that we, you know, that doesn't have this strange behaviour, and the quantum world is entirely measurement. Measurement is the interaction between these two words. So this is, well, so this is um, a device I'm, I'm going to use quite often, like this blue box or a meter on the front. This is measurement. This is taking a measurement of something, measuring a voltage or a position or a momentum or something. And measuring devices that I hold in my hands, they are classical. They measure real numbers. 
um, you know, I get, I, I plug in my volt meter into my experiment and it tells me five volts, never, you know, the square root of minus one volts, never five volts or 10 volts, okay? So this is my classical device. And that's it, the worlds are separated and there's nothing known, there's no, nothing known about this system until you do the measurement. You can predict what your most likely measurement will be. You can predict that if you know this state vector, but there's no value beforehand in this quantum world until you then bring in your classical device, your measuring device, and make a measurement. And so there's a, there's a, a phrase which I was certainly taught in university for thinking about this particular interpretation. We called it SUAC, S-U-A-C, which is shut up and calculate. Okay, so it predicts everything, and you may be uneasy. And this was the like the author, you know, the, the main interpretation for a very, very long time. And it's the only one that ha didn't lead to any kind of real logical inconsistency. You just have to draw a barrier. You have you have quantum things, and you have classical things. So this. So just looking more at this philosophy, this psi, this state vector, whatever you want to call it, it describes the whole system. Um, and it kind of, if you look at how it changes, it's just an aspect of it that's a bit like a wave. But it's not physical. It's not actually a wave. It's not actually a particle moving, even though it seems to have properties that are a bit like both of those things. And then really importantly, you choose what to measure and then that system will have a value. So I choose to measure position, and by measuring a position, then then there's like, you know, an electron with a position in there. Or I choose to measure a momentum, and then there's an electron with a certain momentum in there. And remember, it matters which way around I did that as well, which we'll come back to. And this property is chosen entirely probabilistically. It's not known beforehand. The, this interpretation, Copenhagen interpretation, um, is, is not like statistical mechanics. It's not saying that there are electrons flying around which have a certain momentum, but I just don't have any way of measuring this, but it has some kind of momentum. And you know, I just, I just don't know what it is, so I have to make some broad general statements guessing what it is with a probabilistic distribution. That's not what it's saying. The Copenhagen interpretation says, this property does not exist before I measure it. I'm going to go through this a lot more. This is the original interpretation of quantum physics. And it leads to and predicts some strange behavior beyond it just being a strange esoteric theory that has some consequences. Let's see if we remember what this means. So what does this quantum state mean? So the psi, the Greek symbol, um, and the, the fact that it's in those kind of that funny bracket, a ket, um, is just saying that it's, it's, um, it's a state of this particle. I've got some particle, in, and this is what its, it's wave function looks like. It's got some amount of being at a position, x1, some position over here, and it's got some amount of being in a position, x2. And so what this means, if I, if I measure where this particle is, if I, if I prepare this psi, and I measure where this particle is over and over again, then 36% of the time, I'm going to find it at position x1, that happens to be 0.6 squares. And then 64% of the time, I find it at position x2. That's what that means. It means if I do that measurement a thousand times, then 360 times I'm going to find it in x1, and 640 I'm going to find it in x2. Um, right. So my wave function goes down to that. So is that strange at all? Um, this is a bit like saying, you know, it's either here or there, or it goes through one of the slits or it doesn't. And the fact is that time and time again, this has proved to be the wrong way of thinking about it, here or there. Time and time again, it's proved that it's not a mixture of these two places. Before you measure it, it is not in one place or the other. So, for example, if you're thinking about the double slit experiment, um, you could say, well, it either goes through one of the holes or it goes through the other hole. But 
we know that if we disturb one of the holes, if we have a look at it with a measuring device, then it doesn't behave in this quantum way anymore. So it has to somehow know if there's one or two holes or if something's looking at the hole. So it has to somehow go through both those holes at the same time, or at least know about both those holes at the same time. Um, and this is called superposition. This, this principle of you can be in two different places at the same time, or many. I've picked two here because it's easiest to deal with. And so this is actually notoriously difficult to prove that it's that there's a difference between it being here or there, and here and there. Um, and so, um, but it has been. So I'm going to try this. This didn't actually. It's not the the clearest thing, but. Um, it was the clearest experiment I could find to try and explain this. Okay, so what have we got? So, as you see this disclaimer down the bottom, this, this is not precise, but it's, it's, it will give you a good idea of um, how it's, it's different, or at least how we think about it classically is different from what actually happens in the real world. Um, and this isn't entirely precise, but it's, it's close enough, and it's you can look up the actual paper, but it takes a while to get your head around. It's from David Wyman, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And so what, what this means here is I've got here um, a charged particle, actually, an ion. I think in the experiment it was a beryllium ion. Right? And this um, beryllium ion, the, the electron inside this, um, one of the electrons attached to this ion can have two different energies, which we're going to call up. And we're going to call down. So what these two things mean is the up arrow means that this ion is in the state with the energy up, or this ion is in the state with the energy down. And I, I do it with this because this is how we would do it as quantum physicists. This is the kind of notation we use. So I think it's interesting to show it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine a laser at this. This is going to give it a bit of energy. And what that allows is it allows you either to move it from the um, the down energy state into the up energy state, or the up energy state into the down energy state. If you think about it as, as kicking an electron out further from the atom, and then the next pulse would knock that electron back down. Uh, yeah, that's right. You can think about it like that. And so um, you can do this quite straightforwardly, such that you have, you send in a pulse of laser light for a certain amount of time, and it's a short enough time that there's a 50% chance that it's going to give some energy to the electron and excite it or knock it down. So I shine on my laser pulse onto this ion, and then afterwards it is either up or down, classically, as I'm talking about here. So, you know, it's just some kind of probabilistic thing where I've shone on this pulse not quite long enough to definitely excite it, and not quite short enough to definitely not excite it. I've, got, I've done it long enough that there's a 50% chance it's Going up or down, right? And so this is what happens after this laser pulse once. So either my particle is up here in this energy or down here in this energy. And then the experiment is I do it again. And so what happens? Well, nothing particularly mysterious happens. This is what I end up with at the end if I do this thing twice. Is I still either up or down because if the first pulse flipped the electron up, uh, the ion up in energy. Then, say it was here, and I do the pulse again, it's got a 50-50 chance of staying here or being knocked down. So it's still 50-50 that it ends up here or here. And the same for if it started off here, I do this laser pulse, it's got a 50-50 probability of being sent up or staying in this, where it does. So I do this experiment twice, and there's a 50-50 chance of measuring the, um, e either energy. And that's what classical physics was saying. It's all very easy to get your head around. That's not quite what happens um, in quantum physics. So quantum physics says that you put this um, ion in a superposition, this is what I'm trying to say, of up and down. Okay. So maybe this is just me quibbling over words, but instead of it being sent up and down, it's sent up or down. I would actually draw a picture to represent this in quantum physics. We call it the, the block sphere. So this would be where, why do I, doesn't matter. There's my up, and then here's my down, and this kind of lives, start off on a circle, it lives on a circle, and so if I send in my laser pulse, what happens is the energy starts to rotate around until it's up, 
looking at these points here. This is up, plus, down, and this is up, minus, down. When you square these to find what the probability of finding it in, then it doesn't matter if it's a minus sign. You still got a 50 50 chance of being an either one when I actually do the measurement, but it matters here. So, if the, what this means is if the um, ion starts in the energy pointing down, I send in a laser pulse, it rotates around here, and I, you know, with time, and if I stop my laser pulse here, but it ends up in this state up and down. So, does this have any consequence on things, or is it exactly the same? And so, here I do this experiment again. So, it starts off down. Okay, so I've drawn this diagram the wrong way around, but it doesn't matter. So I've done this pulse once, it goes this way around anti-clockwise, clockwise, anti-clockwise. And I've taken this, I've done one laser pulse, and it's put it up here, into up minus down. So that's what's happened. So if I did the measurement now, if I measured what the energy was, I would find it in up 50% of the time, and I'd find it in down 50% of the time. So you might say, that is nothing weird, it is up or down. Nothing, there's no such thing as up and down, that doesn't make any sense. But the thing is, if I do this pulse again, then that's not what I get. So I have this, and then this, this um, up will rotate to an up plus down, and this down will rotate to an up minus down. So you get this coming out at the end. And so what the mathematics of it say um, is that these two ups cancel out. There's an up here and a minus up here, and they cancel out. And there's no chance whatsoever, zero percent chance of the energy being in the up state, and a hundred percent chance of it being in a down state, because up and down is different to up or down. And experiment shows us. I know it's a, it's a hard one to, to be convinced by, but it's very, very hard to find an experiment in superposition that isn't just a double slit experiment, where you say it has to go through both holes at the same time. But it's not limited to the superposition, uh, to the double slit experiment. There are many, many experiments where you can see this, and this is shining laser beams on atoms and how they behave. And so you do this and you get it 100% in the down state, whereas if it was behaving by the rules of classical physics, you'd measure it 50% up or down. And you can, you can chase that reference if you want. I've given you all that paper in our shared folder. Okay, let's go on from superposition to entanglement. So, what we're going to imagine here is we have something that... Right, yes. Um, is it only in the down position of the second chart? It's only definitely in the down position after the second try. And after the first pulse, it could be up or down. You'd measure it 50 to 50 in either one. But because up or down is different from up and down, after the second pulse, it ends up always down. Okay, so what we can imagine, we have some kind of particle decay here. So we have some nucleus or something that's going to just break apart and send out two chunks. Okay. There we go. Bang. Like this. So there are two chunks. And so, because we have nice things like conservation momentum, if I find where one of these particles is, then I know a lot about where the other particle is, right? That's not particularly mysterious. So, for example, if I had a screen and I uh, saw this particle hit here, and I had a symmetrical screen up here, then I know the other particle must be, must be about to hit up here, because they have to be emitted in opposite directions to conserve momentum. Let's go bang like this. Okay? So I can learn something about, about it. And you know, if you know one of them is more massive and it takes away some of the energy, then I can I, I know what the velocity of the other one will be. So if I do my measurements at different times, I can learn something about what the other particle will be doing in terms of its momentum. Okay, so that's just a very common physical situation. But again, quantum physics uh, doesn't interpret this experiment like this. What quantum physics says is that as soon as you measure something about this one, then instantly that one will have the complementary property. So I'm saying if I measure this particle to be here, I know that particle will be there. And quantum physics says neither particle is anywhere until I do the measurement. 
So as soon as I measure this particle to be here, then that particle becomes there instantly. This is entanglement, spooky action at a distance. By measuring something about this particle, the other particle um, instantly gets a property. Okay, so this is how um, we would have uh, this is how we would have pictured it in a more kind of quantum mechanical setting. So in quantum physics, there's no um, particle. I can't, you know, there's no individual particles. Um, I have my I have my um, particle decay, and that's my quantum system. That's where it starts. And so here's my state vector, kind of evolving. Something's happening. You know, here's my quantum state. Something very mysterious is going on, and we don't know. And there's no particles in there. There's just some properties, and that we don't know until we measure them. And then I do a measurement, bam, and there's that particle, and that forces that particle to then be over there. Right? That's how quantum physics interprets it. And so not only that, and this kind of will give you an idea of how you can actually measure, but it's slightly different from just, well, of course, if I measure one of the particles, we know where the other one will be, because that's just conservation momentum. Um, think about doing a slightly more complicated measurement. So here's my particle in the case. And I I choose yes. Are you saying that the part, not um, not the particles don't have a fixed momentum until you measure them, but they don't exist until you measure them? Um well I mean what is a particle? It's a blob of momentum perhaps. So as there's no yes, well in this theory we'd say yes, there's I mean there is some energy flying around. There's, you know, it's not like there's a, a blank space and you just magically conjure a big ball of energy out. That energy is, is there, but it's not in, you know, kind of some shape you could draw. Oh. Does that mean that you always get what you're looking for? I mean, because in the device, you always get well, yes. Yeah. So, for example, in this particular experiment, say, then you would you would know what kind of thing you're looking for. But as I'm about to describe, what matters is what you try and measure. So it's not so much whether you're trying to look for an electron, if you're trying to look for a photon, it's what you're trying to learn about those things. So if I'm trying to find where it is, then that will have a different impact to if I'm trying to find out how fast it's going. So that's what I'm going to say. So say I had this decay, this, this experiment, and I did it, you know, a thousand times, right? And I just, or a million times or something, and I just kind of did some measurement. So I decide what I'm choosing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I'm going to call particle one the one that's submitted on this, this half, right? And I'm going to choose to measure the position of that particle. You can do it a thousand times. And then I say, and then on whatever particle on the other half, I'm going to choose to measure instead this momentum. Right? So I do this experiment a thousand times and I get two numbers. Right? I've chosen the thing. And did this experiment again. And instead I said, well, I'm going to take this particle that's on the left hand side and I'm going to measure its momentum first. I'm not going to measure the position of this particle and then the momentum of the other particle. I'm going to measure this momentum first. And I do that experiment. Then I get a different momentum. So I do this experiment a million times. Here, these two particles fly off. I measure the position of this one, and then the momentum of the other one, and I get a number. And then I do the experiment another million times, and I measure the momentum of this one first, and I get a different number. Because by measuring the position of this one, I've instantly changed the properties of the other one. By measuring the momentum of this one, I instantly change. I could have reversed it and done the positions instead. So by measuring the properties of one part, and you can do this experiment almost as said, right? You can almost, you can do it as said. You can make either something that decays, or you can get something that um, you send in one photon and it splits the photon into two of a lower energy, and they fly off, and you do the measurement. You know, there are many, many ways you can do this. But still, it is kind of hard to prove that something really weird's going on. I don't know how well this will do it, but what we do have um, is a little game. Which I borrowed from um, an esteemed colleague over at Imperial College, Professor Terry Rudolph. Um, he doesn't know I borrowed it, but he wouldn't mind, so it's okay. Um, 
And so this is often how people like to, to think about what actually is different, would be different if you did if from quantum physics to you know, classical physics, what really would be different? And people often like to, to talk about this in terms of games you play. Why do they do? Hmm. And so we're going to play a game. We're, we're going to see. We're going to try and test if people have psychic powers or not. So I've got two people who say they're going to do a little game that proves they're psychic, and I want to go. I I want to come up with a test to decide whether they are psychic or they're not psychic. Okay. But they get to they get to pick some of the rules within reason, and I'm going to decide whether they're psychic or not. So I need. Uh, four volunteers, and there's going to be two games. So I'm not going to give people a chance to uh, say no. I'm just going to take you four. It's not an arduous game. I'm sorry. Honestly, it's not a, it's not an embarrassing game or anything silly. It's a very boring game that involves tossing coins. So uh, I'm going to pause the presentation as well. So that one's a terrible, terrible strategy for telling if you're psychic. So I'm come up with a more clever game that they're going to find it harder to win. Okay? Right, so I, I come up with a really great game that said, um, I can tell if these people are psychic or not, and I can beat them. So the probability that they will obey the rules of my game, they will do that at the most 75% of the time. The best strategy you can possibly come up with will win that game 75% of the time. And if they agree more than three quarters of the time, then they can only do that by being psychic. They just beat the rules of maths, and they're just doing it by communicating method, no matter how complicated they make their strategy in a classical setting. Okay, but... You can also do this game in a quantum model. So how might we do um, the quantum version of this game? So in the quantum version of the game, I'll try and talk through it, um, my strategy is going to be a bit different. So each of the players who are on either side, here and here, they have a measuring device. And you can measure two values, okay, left or right. We've got a measuring device. And so this could say be the polarization of a photon, okay? So the polarization of a photon, so a photon could maybe either be vertically polarized or horizontally polarized, and you could measure the difference between those two things. That's an example. It could be like that experiment I tried to explain. It could be a down energy and an up energy, okay? So it's just a measurement device that can, that can, that can measure one of two things, and they, they both try and measure the same thing. And um, beforehand, they agree, I'm going to uh, give myself a bit more space. Beforehand, they agree that if they get a heads or tails, right, then they're going to they're going to rotate their detector by a certain amount. Okay. So why is that important? So say it was um, the polarization of a photon. That's a particularly good one. So a photon is light. Light travels as an electromagnetic wave. There's a direction in which the electric field oscillates, which you can measure and it oscillates in a straight line. So it's either going like this or like this, or at some other kind of angle. But um, say often when you um, produce a pair of photons in a, like a decay like this, then those two properties are entangled. Say so one has to be vertical and the other one has to be vertical. Or depending on how you do it, one would be vertical and one has to be horizontal. So their properties are linked somehow. Okay. And so if I have my detector and the polarization is vertical, and I align the detector, and it's exactly in line, then if it's vertically polarized, I get a tick. And if it's horizontally polarized, I get zero. And if I have any other angle in between, then it's probabilistic because it has a bit of up and a bit of across. If I have my detector at 45 degrees and um, a photon comes in, it's pointing up, the detector sees it equally as pointing along this axis or not pointing along that axis. It's a bit confused, but anyway, this detector can measure this property. So, Beforehand, my game players say, depending on the outcome of the toy coin toss, I'm going to rotate my detector by certain angles. So say player one says, if I get a heads, I rotate it by 30 degrees, and if I get a tails, I rotate it by 60 degrees. And player two goes, if I get a heads, I'm going to rotate it by 15 degrees. If I get a tail, I'm going to 
rotated by 80 degrees. And for whatever game you come up with, there's an the optimum strategy which you can work out from doing this. And then the, depending on the outcome of the measurement, they hold up a card, right? So they're, they're then communicating their coin toss. So here's my coin toss, and they rotate their detectors. And then, bang, there goes their quantum happening. They measure the property of that particle, and then they measure a red or a green. And the thing is that for this particular game, the probability of, of beating my game, of obeying my rules, is 85%, which means that by the laws of classical physics, it is 99.999995 five nines after that 99 percent certain that they are psychic. There's only like a, uh, let's have a look at that, like a one in a, um, a million percent chance that they've got lucky, right? You can always get lucky and beat it. But it's vanishingly unlikely. And you can just, you know, do it more and more times. And this is what's called um, a Bell's inequality, um, named after John Bell. And um, it's really, and I, I do understand, it's really difficult to intuitively <coughs> prove that superposition is different from being here and or there, and that entanglement is different, is different from just you know something about one thing, so you know something about the other thing, just because of the laws of physics, right? It's, it's really hard to prove these things, but what I'm trying to show you is there are things you can measure that do prove it. So there are differences if you did the experiment classically with a classical particle and then with a quantum particle, you did the measurement, you'll get different outcomes because of these strange effects like entanglement. Um, so what John Bell said is if they beat this particular game, and, you know, there are somehow real particles of real properties flying around, like whizzing around, right, like we imagine them to, then the only way that they can affect each other instantaneously over this distance is, um, what do I, is that it is truly instantaneous, or non-local, we call that in physics, which means truly instant, much faster than the speed of light. So you could have one photon on one side of the universe and another photon on the other side of the universe, and you measure one photon and the second photon instantly changes, instantly changes. And the only way that doesn't happen is if beforehand there aren't these real particles. If you just imagine it as this wave function, this state vector, this abstract mathematical concept, then nothing has to move faster than the speed of light. The whole system just collapses. You can't transfer any information about these particles faster than the speed of light, and it's all okay. So Bell actually was trying to prove that there are real particles and he accidentally ended up showing that you've got two options. Either there are real particles and they can affect each other only over any distance instantaneously, or there are not real particles and you don't have this problem. It's just an abstract thing going on. It doesn't involve real particles having real properties before you measure them. And particles having properties before you actually measure them is often called a hidden variable theory. And I could, you know, talk about this at length, and other people certainly um, could talk about it at length. But actually, this um, this uh, review by Alan Aspey that I've referenced there is is, is a really nice nice uh, way of thinking about it. So, I recommend you have a look at that. Experimentally, so Bell's inequalities have been violated in many many experiments. There have been many experiments where it has been proved that entanglement is happening. Something weird is happening. That there are either not real particles in the universe or that things are communicating instantaneously over arbitrarily long distances. And Alan Aspey did um, um, a lot of his experiments um, and, and he's still awaiting a Nobel Prize. Um, and so the record is that at any one time, 100,000 photons at the same time have been entangled. So you affect one of those photons and then 99,999 uh, other ones change, essentially. So that's the record um, we currently hold with, with entangling numbers of particles. I believe with actual matter, the record is 16 or 30, that kind of amount with ions. So, it's not just um, photons. And the record distance over which this experiment has been done is 300 kilometers. Okay, 
So this experiment has been done, you fire off the things, you let them travel 150 kilometers in each direction, and then you do your measurement, and you see that there's this instantaneous effect, or particles aren't real. Right, so this is the state of the art that we're currently in. So, I've told you some more weird stuff. I really haven't told you any interpretations still, but I, I just want you to, you know, I just want to say that there are real distinct differences with quantum physics that you can measure that are strange. That's what I've just tried to achieve there. So, how do we interpret this? Because we've moved on a bit from the Copenhagen interpretation, which is where all these things started. This is the point we started from. So what are people trying to do now? So, many people are unhappy about there not being particles in the world, right? They're not existing. Um, namely, probably all of you, and um, Schrodinger and Einstein, they, you know, they just didn't believe, they, they think it did, didn't feel right. We never see these wave functions that we talk about all the time, these state vectors, these operators. We don't, we don't see those things. When we actually do a, a measurement, we, you know, we see some real particles, right? At some point, there seems to be something that's like a real particle, right? We see little points arriving on our detector which have a property. So you can, I can tell you to, um, you know, red in the face that until you measure it, that it doesn't exist. But, you know, what we see are real particles. And, you know, Copenhagen interpretation really does say that just, they did, these particles do not exist beforehand. It's measurement which forces this state vector to become something with a value. That anything that's in your awareness doesn't exist in your awareness. Yeah, and, and so and you might, but, but um, it, it doesn't have to be human centric necessarily. Um, so, for example, the floor is measuring at the tables there because the table's touching the floor, okay? So it doesn't have to, we don't, we don't have to bring people's minds into this yet. Um, uh, um, but when you get very, very tiny, um, it's increasingly likely that one thing doesn't disturb another thing, and so it has some time to go before it's measured and can evolve its properties. But again, we'll, we'll cover these ideas. Okay, so this is going to be my test experiment in which I'm going to show you what the different interpretations mean. So kind of where we start is we have a particle, and I'm just going to have a single slit here, okay, to make it even simpler. And so the Schrodinger equation says that the particle evolves, and I describe how it moves with my wave function. And this wave function, um, I can then measure. I've got a big a line of detectors here, and I'm going to measure where this thing happens. Now, the, the, the Schrodinger equation just says that the wave function just kind of comes up to all of these detectors. And so all of the detectors should measure it, really. So the particle becomes entangled with all of the detectors, is what the Schrodinger equation says. But then, by hand, we put in the Born rule, if you remember, that says, actually, there's a probability that I'm just going to measure it in one place, which is put in afterwards by hand. So this is where we're starting with a Schrodinger equation, which just says, I've got this wave function, and no one knows what this wave function is, and it will come up to these detectors. But then it can't explain what happens once it's come up to the detectors. And then we've come along with our Born rule, which is incredibly useful, which says if I square this wave function, it gives me the probability of finding it in a certain place, and I will find it in a certain place. Um, so um, what Copenhagen says about this is it uses a word called collapse. Uh, it's a word you come across often. And so what it says is the wave function will come up to this point at which it is measured, and then it will collapse to be in one place or another. And I mean, all they've done is they've just given it a word. And so this is called the measurement problem. Like, how does this particle all of a sudden have the probability of being in all these different places and then collapse to be in one place? Why is that? That's along with the fact that depending on what you decide to measure or which device you use to measure gives you a different outcome on a future measurement. This is called the measurement problem. Yeah. Can we prove that until we measure a particle it's in both positions of once. Well, you can prove it. It's had to say take several different parts at the same time, for example. Yeah. Because it will do things that are fundamentally different than if it, if it hadn't just gone in a straight line. So, what what I would call 
orthodox quantum mechanics. Um, yeah. No, you don't. The interference stops working. Um, unless the detector doesn't tell you anything about where the particles go. Right? So if it just tells you the charge of it or something, it doesn't give you any information about where it will go. Okay, so, so I called this orth orthodox quantum mechanics because this is kind of like the, the middle ground way that people now, you know, um, I'd say about the majority of quantum physicists view quantum mechanics now, which is trying to tackle with this, this thing from Copenhagen, which is that you have a quantum system and then you have your measuring device and that's the interface with the, with the classical world. There's a divide. It's not a continuum. There's quantum stuff and there's not quantum stuff. That's one of the things that Copenhagen says. And so what I call orthodox quantum mechanics has tackled this. And it re re relies on, on something called decoherence. So what does decoherence mean? So coherence is a term that we often use to describe um, um, something that can do something quantum and weird. So if something has coherence, it can then go on and do a quantum thing that's strange. But it doesn't matter what it means, but that, so decoherence is removing that strangeness. Um, and so this is amazingly, this kind of theory is only really noted, well, kind of noticed or, or tackled in, in the 70s, and only really developed a lot in the 90s. And it's, instead of just trying to work out the quantum physics of your particle, or your initial state, so there's my initial state, there's a box, and I'm saying that inside that box there's something that I could measure at some point, the state vector. But it's it's going on and saying, well, what about the box? Okay. I mean, what about the box? I'm just imagining this box is a passive thing, right? But actually, you know, the particle might bump into the wall of the box. And so when you, what decoherence says is that when you start to think about well, if I have my state vector describing an electron in this box, and then I also try and add in how do I describe all the atoms in the walls, it turns out the more particles you keep on pumping into the theory and grinding through the mass, which often takes very big computers, the more particles you add, the less quantum stuff happens. So just out of the theory, naturally. So you have your quantum theory, and if you have a single electron isolated on its own, it would do interference, entanglement, and all this stuff. But once I actually have to start considering my box or, say, my detector, my detector's like some massive chunk of thing made out of millions and millions of atoms. Once you start considering that, then, and you solve that, then it no longer predicts strange behaviour. So, for example, decoherent theory would say if you have a single molecule, right, in space, and the molecule is just subject to background uh, black body radiation of the universe, you know, they have these satellites and they send out and they can measure the temperature of the entire universe, these lovely maps, but well, that's photons whizzing around and they're hitting this molecule. And the decoherence caused by those photons um, is enough to stop a free molecule in space behaving in a, in a quantum way. So you have to isolate your system quite well until you see a quantum effect of what decoherence is. Yeah. If you had a particle and then you measured it and you said, okay, this particle, if I did this to it, behave quantumly. And then you measure, and then you put another particle into the system, you measure that one, and then you measure the other particle, and you kept adding particles and measuring all the mm -hmm. particles in turn. Would the original particle get less and less quantum? Yes, but yeah, well, I mean, it depends what you do. So you can very carefully prepare both of the particles to be um, what we'd call in a quantum state. So prepare them in such a way that they'd undergo the rules of quantum physics. And if you don't do that carefully, yes, it's very easy to prove that you wash out some of your coherence. In fact, if you did the double slit experiment, say, and um, instead of having a lovely cold beam of electrons, and they're, they're really hot, and so they have lots of momentum in all kinds of different directions, then you still get the fringes, but they're really faint, the contrast drops. So there isn't quantum or not quantum, there's a, there's a spectrum between. Um, there, there isn't a, a, a firm knife edge that says, you know, but yes, it, it washes out. Um, quantum mechanics seems very promising, and people are working very actively on trying to do decoherence, but it becomes very difficult. Um, the reason it becomes difficult is that, um, you know, I, I said in the second lecture that we describe all of these quantum um, things by, you know, in terms of these matrices, which is like a 
square of numbers and stuff, and, and every additional particle you add just increases the dimension of the thing. So if I had 100 particles, then the dimension of my, my box that I have to solve the equations in becomes 2 to the 100 dimensional. It becomes very hard to solve on classical computers. Oh, hint there. Um, so um, anyway, so what orthodox QM tries to do is that it removes the need to describe the environment and the system as different. Often we still have to because it's very hard to treat the environment because there's many, many particles. But it's trying. This is a strategy of trying to think about everything involved in your experiment rather than just the one particle on its own. So collapse still happens, but it turns out in this theory that it's no longer instantaneous. It's kind of rapid. It's rapid. So the quantum particle interacts with this system of many, many, many hundreds of particles and rapidly focuses in to having a property, being in a place, to having a certain momentum. But it's still entirely probabilistic. It doesn't predict for you exactly what that probability will be. It says that the it says that the um, you know the wave function is going to collapse onto a, onto a um, value because it has interacted with this big thing. So instead of me just arbitrarily saying I have a quantum system, I have a classical system, which is my measuring device, and they're two different things and they don't talk to each other. Instead of doing that, it says I have a quantum system and I have a really big system that when a quantum system interacts with it in a quantum way, the quantumness washes out. That's essentially what it does. But it doesn't solve this problem of probabilistic measurement. I still can only predict what's most likely to happen. So at what point yeah. did it collapse when it goes through the slip? Why it does it? Why doesn't it collapse? Doesn't it? Why when should it? it? Oh, well, it would, it would if it hit the side of the slip. And you can measure the momentum change. So, I mean, it has to go through the gap. So the slit is com confining it. It has to go through the slit. If it doesn't go through the slit, if it hits the edge, then it bounces back. And if it kind of glances off at some angle, you can. people have got very clever and tried to calculate exactly what happens. It doesn't really make any difference. It's just so rare to happen. But yeah, so that's why if we put a measurement device in one of the gaps or near one of the gaps, then it would essentially be measured by that. And now if I think about what's my quantum system, my quantum system is no longer one quantum particle going through this double slit. It's one quantum particle going through this double slit, which you're right, you have to make sure the particle doesn't actually hit, or else it would decohere here, because the slit isn't quantum. But then you've also got to think, if my measurement um, device can measure the particle, then it has to interact with the particle somehow, so then that has to be part of my quantum system. And is it realistic that my um, device made out of a thousand atoms is actually going to do anything in a quantum way? And the answer happens to be no. So. Right, so that's orthodox QM, and so... That's what we use a lot um, conceptually, but it doesn't really help us in measurement. Another strategy which, uh, comes in and out of popularity is, is that real particles really exist, that there are really particles flying around. The last interpretation didn't give us particles, but it kind of explained why we don't see quantum physics everywhere all the time. But, Still, until you measure something, until it hits the wall of the box or something, it hasn't got a property. So now, now we have a strategy which is, well, okay, let's start from the assumption that real particles actually exist. And so De Broglie started with this. Um, he was the guy who came up with the idea that everything had a wave nature. Um, and so Einstein um, and Schrodinger really pushed him to kind of develop this idea. Um, and so he... he um, thought of the, the wave function, Schrodinger equation, as like a wave that guided a particle. So there's, he called it a pilot wave. So there's a wave of something and the particle is guided by this. So it kind of feels out ahead of it and, you know, tells the particle what's going on. Okay, and that's how it kind of moves along. Um, but but it, it, it communi has, still has to communicate this idea in a non-local way, in an instant way. Okay, and so you have to ask yourself if you're worried by that. I mean, why should you necessarily? I mean, yes, Einstein told us that nothing going faster than the speed of light in the vacuum, but, you know, his theories aren't I mean, always correct, right? So does it matter? But the thing is that the, the, um, the Broglie theory completely failed. It didn't work anymore if you had even two particles. It worked for one particle, tried to describe two particles, it just stopped working. And so then later, Einstein 
um, really nudge this guy, David Bone, um, to pick up the idea. Um, because Einstein really wanted to prove. Einstein was desperate to prove that there were real particles. Desperate, desperate to prove that. So he nudged this guy. Um, and I think if Einstein tells you to work on something, you probably work on it. And um, and so what Bohm kind of said is that there, there really does exist. Like if I take a snapshot of the, of the whole universe, and there is some configuration of all the particles in the universe. You know, there's a place that all of them are, and you know, an energy that all of them have. There's some configuration, pretty configuration, that's what he said. And that a guiding equation, so which would be the wave function, determines how all these things interact with each other and how they all move. Um, and it's governed by the wave function. Um, but again, that um, relies on the um, this, this guiding equation this guiding uh, equation, this configuration, to be able to be updated instantly. So what it means is that if there was like a sun, like in 10 galaxies away, maybe it wobbling a little bit, it's going to affect an electron in this table a little bit instantly. And maybe that can explain some of the things we see in quantum physics. And so that's a hidden variable theory. It's suggesting there are particles with properties. So it requires something to be non-local, things happening instantaneously. But really, you know, it's really suggesting that there are real, true physical properties that these particles all have. And it makes all the same predictions that orthodox quantum mechanics um, does. And in this case, uh, the, the wave function um, uh, really represents, you know, the wave function of many particles is the particle density in his theory. Um, let me get to the end and I'll come back. Um, and so Bohm... Um, you know, he was a, he, he was a real believer in, in, in particles, but also in um, in the pervasiveness of quantum mechanics, and that it explained really everything. So, particularly in, in like how your brain worked, um, he had this theory of quantum holograms about how your brain worked, which I don't know anything about. Um, but he was kind of he had to leave work in America because he he um, well he was uh, had communist leanings, um, and he lived in um, Brazil Brazil for a while and Britain for a while. Um, and actually, a lot of his ideas were kind of just ignored um, after some initial success because he happily picked up a lot of his Indian philosophy personally. Not he didn't try and apply it to his work, and so people didn't take him seriously because he kind of picked up all these kind of Indian philosophical ideas. And so, um, kind of very unfairly, uh, his ideas were not taken seriously because he wasn't taken seriously. Um, yeah, sorry, the question. Uh, just going back to photons. How do you entangle them? How do you entangle them? Um, there are ways that there are ways that, for example, you could get. Um, well, sometimes it's not easy. So what's very hard is to get two photons and have them interact. Photons are very bad at interacting and entangle. But um, one particular way is there are there are a lot of different crystals. But if you shine in light of one colour, you'll get um, light of two colours coming out of it, um, conserving energy. So um, a photon goes in and two photons come out, and those photons are entangled. In a couple of ways, they're entangled in energy or colour because they can't. The two photons coming out can't have more energy than the photon that went in. So if you measure the colour of one of the photons, you instantly know what the colour of the other one is. Um, and also, they're kind of entangled in time because they have the same velocity um, and they start from the same point. So if you find one of the photons, then you know where the other photon will be or where it will have reached in that time. So, so there are ways of doing it. Good, okay, so of Bohmian mechanics. So this is this is this complicated wave function, guiding wave or pilot wave, whatever you want to call it in this theory, and it exists, right? It exists, it just is there. And here's my particle, which really exists, it's really a particle. And the thing is that, that it that it will follow a path set out by this thing. And if everything was the same every time it would follow the same path, but just like in statistical mechanics, there's just everything you know is interacting with a little bit everywhere. You know, it's being bombarded by photons, and the configuration of this depends on you know every other particle in the entire universe. The configuration of this, and so even if you do the same experiment many times, the particle will take slightly different routes, and it will end up in slightly different places. You can again make predictions about where it's most likely to. Um, so this is just like statistical mechanics. This is suggesting that we um, but it's not, uh, it's not that these particles don't have a true path they take. They have a true path, 
It's our knowledge which is lacking. It's too complicated to calculate it. Just like there's no computer in the world that could tell you the path that every molecule in this room right now is taking. Right? There's no computer in the world. And we've got rid of computer. Okay? So this is just a lack of knowledge rather than a lack of particles and paths. Yeah. If you have a completely enclosed system, yeah. what's the maximum number of particles you could put in and be able to calculate every single one's velocity? It depends on the, on the computer, but people very much struggle to do, you do even do the hundreds. Okay. What do you mean classically or, or quantum? Um, on the scale. Yeah, you know, on a quantum level, it's you know it's it's it's, it's difficult to even get in, in the hundreds. Very challenging. Um, and that's big computers. That's where you have to you know you have several universities sharing one giant computer and you can get like a month. So here's my test experiment again, um, and this is what Bohmian mechanics would say. They would say there's some equation which determines how this particle gets to this slit. Here are my detectors, and then that particle truly takes a path to one of the detectors, and it's too complicated to work out exactly what path it's going to take because you have to consider everything in the universe, but it's going to take a path, and I can predict where it's most likely to end up quite easily. Um, but, but in theory, you could track the motion of everyone. Okay. So, okay. So it restores the idea of there being real particles. And it removes any like tricky conceptual idea of, of measurement or collapse because they just go somewhere and they arrive at a detector. It, so it removes all of the weirdness, really. It just means that you know it's just a lack of our knowledge rather than, than a, a lack of physicality. But it requires non locality It requires everything in the universe to be able to communicate instantaneously with everything else. So it takes your money, it takes your choice. Interpretation that we're going to deal with, which is the one you may well have heard of, it's called many worlds theory. Yes. An easy one to send up the many worlds. Okay, I'm going to have to try and remember. Um, my, my notes have stopped working now, but that should be okay from here. So, Hugh Everett, even though um, so he had a very well respected PhD supervisor, John Wheeler. And um, John Wheeler pushed him to develop this, this idea that he kind of had thinking of with many worlds, which is that, um, at, um, um, he didn't call it many worlds, but at every point where you have to try and take a measurement, that everything that can happen does happen, it just branches off into different realities. So there's no probability anymore. So, okay, I say that, um, you know, I'm most likely to measure something being here, but I know there's a chance I can measure it over there. So if I measure it, I do my measurement and it pops out here, it just so turns out that it also appears in um, all of the other places it possibly could, just in different realities to the ones I observe, different universes. Somehow it branches out, it happens in a different way. Um, it wasn't taken very seriously. Um, even though John Wheeler, I mean, there was more subtle, subtleties to it than that. And John Wheeler really pushed it, um, his supervisor, and they sent him all over the place, but no one really picked up. And he got very disheartened, um, whoever, and he went off, and I think he worked on the computers in the end. Um, and he died incredibly unhealthy, depressed, overweight, chain smoker. Um, and one of the reasons, I mean, so actually it was a bit of a, a philosophical start to this to be quite so unhealthy, because he thought that one of the consequences of his theory was that uh, he called it quantum immortality. So the idea here is that everything that can happen will happen, and at every point that you die, there's always some small chance that you don't die at that particular point. Now, what determines the actual second you die? And the only reality you're going to experience is the one where you live, right? You don't experience the reality where you die. You're dead. You can only experience the reality 
where you continue to live. As he believes that all of us are immortal and that we just, in our own experience, we, we never die because we, we only experience the realities in which we're alive. This was we left, so... Uh, no, that was a supervisor, it was, it was Everett himself. Oh, it's Everett himself. And then this theory is kind of picked up... Um, It's kind of picked up um, in the 60s and 70s by by Wheeler, who called it who called it um, many worlds. I wonder if I've got what it was called. Uh, oh yeah, Everett called it a relative state theory. Um, so so this guy Bryce DeWitt picked it up in the 60s and 70s and 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 kind of pushed it a bit, and and it's become popular and it is truly now um, it's a really really mainstream really mainstream interpretation of quantum physics. It solves a lot of problems. Um, and whether it actually means that every time that something happens, reality branches out into an infinite number of different realities, or actually more kind of precisely that the entire universe is described like one big quantum state is continuously rearranging itself within. That's more and more uh, taken away. Um, and there's price to it. Um, the experiment which we were describing. So I got the universe and I have a particle in it, right, which is described by the sum of all the possible things I could then later measure, all the different positions it could possibly have. And so when it comes to measuring it, all of the possible positions it could have do happen. They all happen. We experience one of them. Yeah. Is this only... So it really is. Um, so, so this theory still actually contains delocalized uh, decoherence. So decoherence explains why the wave function ends up collapsing somewhere. But where it happens, it happens in all the places it can, it can happen. Um, so it's not probabilistic as such. The problems are, how does the universe decide uh, which different states the system will take um, so, like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? How does the universe decide that you know there's a there's a universe? If there's a universe in which I decide to measure position first and then momentum, then that's something so different because then there would have to be a branch which involves me deciding to measure different things. Which isn't this, you know, the original part of the theory wasn't trying to bring in our decisions, and it's just when you went to measure it, all the different measurements you can get. Be different realities. We get very hard to work into this theory um, things like uh, the order you measure things in matters. That becomes very hard, and nearly every time that anyone tries to tackle that, you end up with us having to be in this theory as a consciousness. So actually, it's a very human centric theory, and perhaps why shouldn't it be? I mean, we all get very hung up about particles, which all seems to be a very human centric idea. Um, so decision seems to somehow go into this um, theory. And what does probability mean? Because, you know, I say every time I do a measurement, then everything that can happen will happen. But it's certainly true that I personally will experience the most likely thing that happens the most times. So if everything that can happen will happen, then yes, why doesn't why isn't it equally weighted? There's still some kind of weighting that for some reason you're most likely to experience the most likely thing to happen. And that seems a bit strange. So the problems of this theory are largely, um, largely with how we then, we then interact with the universe. But, um, but it's really popular. And, and so this actually reference I put at the bottom is, um, is a, it's a, it's a famous physicist who's very keen on this theory called David Deutsch, and he came up with an idea of how you might actually test this um, if it was true. So uh, if it's an interpretation and not a theory, that normally means it's not testable, right? But um, there are some recent suggestions perhaps you could test if this were true. Because right? a lot of what I'm talking about now, it's all philosophical. It's an interpretation. It doesn't change the outcome of the measurement. We could predict that from day one. The outcome of the measurement, if that's what we care about, you know, we could have ignored this entire lecture. What I'm trying to look at is how are people thinking how you get to that point. And so David Deutsch thinks that perhaps you could measure if 
many worlds is true. And then I, I added this slide uh, recently. What happens if quantum theory just isn't right? I mean, we've always got to bear that in mind as well. Okay? I mean, we could have just got really lucky. I mean, you know, I mean, Newtonian physics looked really great for many hundreds of years, right? Let's not get smug. Okay? So, sad as I am to say, I mean, it's, I hope it's going to pay me for the rest of my life, but, um, you know, what if it just isn't right? So, there's, there's, that, there's what, that's one extension to quantum theory. So, this is, this is really right up, up at the edge now. This is really people trying to push away from these interpretations. And then another one, um, which actually, um, I, I, you know, has gained a lot of traction recently is, is dealing with collapse, uh, which is the only thing that really makes kind of the Copenhagen interpretation really difficult is why does, just, why does this measurement just seem to collapse and happen really rapidly? Is it actually like the whole of just universe, the whole fabric of is just a little bit noisy and so everything's going over it and it's getting knocked about all the time and the smaller you are the more like you are you are to get disturbed enough that you actually um, collapse this wave function um, that you can predict why it would collapse and so this reference is, is um, talking about that this is uh, called spontaneous collapse theories and this solves a lot of problems and the only reason I really mention this is because this is the only extension to quantum theory which is getting really close to being measurable now so this is kind of like in a, in a few years, um, maybe five years, I think people will be able to see if, if, it, if it works. And so, because people are trying to, and me included, are trying to get larger and larger objects, um, bigger and bigger things to behave in a quantum way. It seems to get increasingly difficult. And if we're wondering whether if it's just technically difficult, whether it's fundamentally impossible, and there's actually some limit. So, there are both different ways, mathematically and philosophically, of interpreting quantum physics. Okay? The thing is that they all yield the same answers and they all make the same predictions. Okay? So, we may have to abandon the idea of there being real particles at a fundamental level. Right? But I, I don't want you to kind of get too depressed about it. Um, 